It's going to be good. Bob's in the house. <laughs> Bob is a good friend of mine. We kind of have this deal. I do premarital counseling for his kids, and then he comes and he speaks for me. So it's kind of a good, cool good deal. deal. Cool kind deal. of a nice deal. We're doing a series called Broken to Beautiful. And when I was thinking about this series, I thought, I'm not sure I know anyone that lives it better than Bob Mortimer. And so I called him just actually probably about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and said, hey, is there any chance you might have this time available? And he says, count me in. So can we give a huge Christ Center welcome to Bob Mortimer? All right. Thank you. Oh, no, hug it, hug it. There we go. There we go. Hey, good morning, everybody. Man, alive. My name's Bob. Say hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Good to be back uh, doing some ministry in the state of Washington. I live here. I'm from here. Don't worry about that. But, uh, you know, uh, since COVID shut down about 18 months of uh, travel ministry, it opened back up again this year. So I've been out and about, out and about in North Dakota, Indiana, places like that in the mid in, out in the middle of our country. Just great to be back in Washington. I, you know, because when I'm out and about, I have to explain to people where I live. I say I'm from the state of Washington, state of Washington, because there's two Washingtons in this country, Washington State, Washington, D.C. And if you don't know this, people out there get us mixed up all the time. The reason is because we both produce a lot of fruits and nuts. <laughs> but I do explain to them that ours grow on trees. Theirs kind of tend to serve in politics, but you know, that, that's just the way it works out there. Hey, I'm looking forward to this morning. I want to really bring you a, a powerful message. I'm hoping that God has prepared your heart, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will begin to increase what you're going to hear today, because I think he has something dynamic for you. But before I go any further, I must do this. I need to wear this to keep you honest, because I know what you're going to do. You're going to leave here today, you're going to go home, you're going to go out to dinner, you're going to be visiting, you're going to be talking to friends, you're going to say, you should have been in church today. There was a man there with a handicap, and he was really funny. Okay, let me explain it. I figure if you'll leave this place and tell people that you saw a man with a handicap, I figure if you leave here and tell people you saw a man with a handicap to keep you from lying, I had better bring a handy. This right here, friends, this is the only handicap that I have. The only handicap. The other things you couldn't help but notice, the missing legs and the missing arm, these are not a handicap. They are an adjustment, though. And I've had to make several adjustments, and I know without a doubt that you have to make several adjustments in your life also. But no matter what we lose, no matter what adjustments we have to make in our life, it will never make us handicapped. Because the only handicap I have, and really the only handicap that anybody in this room will ever have, is the handicap we put on ourselves. And handicaps are the things we put on ourselves that keep us from being who God intended us to be. And God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And a handicap is something that we put upon ourselves, something that we allow into our lives, something that we nurture and foster that hinders God from fulfilling that plan. And it really won't have anything to do with our legs or arms or wheelchairs. The kind of handicaps I'm talking about can be something as simple, um, I don't know, as an attitude. Attitude, right? And I've really been struggling lately on how do I define attitude. It's one of those things that kind of vague in some ways. This is the best way I've come up with lately. I like to think of attitude kind of like a picture frame. And what it is that you're looking through that picture frame and that is the way you see your world right? So if you have like a really rotten attitude, if you have a lousy attitude, if you have a discouraging attitude, if you have a negative attitude, when you look through that frame, 
That is how you're going to see the world around you. On the other hand, if your picture frame, if your attitude is something of hope, something of encouragement, something of joy, something of peace, when you look through that frame, that is how you're going to see the world. And that's why I can say your attitude can really actually end up being a handicap. It can cripple you and disable you and, complete, and, and, and hinder God from fulfilling what he really has for your life. Other handicaps I talk about, I do a lot of school talks. I don't know why they still keep wanting me to come into schools, but they do. So they keep inviting me in. I'll keep going as long as they keep asking. And I talk about the handicap of low self-esteem of how when we compare ourselves to other people and uh, we end up not feeling good about who we are and tell them, how, you know, you need to accept who you are, accept the things that make you different from everybody else. And I tell them, this is something I know a little bit about. <laughs> All I know is what I, I, what I tell them, and the same thing I'll tell you is what I've learned is that when you can accept the things that make you different from everybody else in the room, it's going to make it a lot easier for everybody else to accept you also. I talk about the handicap of prejudice, which is basically judging and putting down other people and all that stuff. And we talk about the handicaps of alcohol and other drugs. And I'll include in that, you know, it's any type of controlling behavior. And really what we're talking about are things like alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling. And then there's probably several other things I didn't put on that list. And just to recap, <laughs> That was like a pun and I didn't even realize it. <laughs> Just to recap. Um, well now you got it, okay? <laughs> I'm glad. Because I, I, at first I said it and I didn't even get it at first. <laughs> but anyway, um, to, to, now I'm off track. <laughs> okay, so to recap, what we're talking about are things that we bring into our lives, that we introduce to our hearts, that we introduce to our day to day. And before long, they can begin to take over. And they're really not what God wanted for our lives. But we begin then to filter everything we see and do and act through those things that are really not God's plan. And it cripples us, disables us, and keeps us handicapped. So, I don't have any problem when you leave here today. Talk to everybody you want. Tell them there was a man today in church with a handicap. I got that. Not offended. Make sure you describe it right. It was blue. Blue had white lettering on it, okay? Hey, I'm, I'm excited about this morning because I want to tell you my story. I love telling my story. And uh, so I'm going to start my story off with when I was young. It wasn't during this decade, <laughs> century, or millennium for that matter. But hey, there was a point in history when even I was young. I grew up in Ohio, grew up in Ohio. And I come from a relatively large family. For, you know, there were seven kids in the family, seven kids. There were two girls and there were five boys. Now, I am the youngest of those five boys. I have four older brothers. No, that is not what happened to me, okay? <laughs> Our father was an alcoholic. Our father was a drug addict. And, and I know, I know, I'm not the only person in this room that can say that. When we're in the schools, and I've got those 1,200 kids in the gymnasium sitting in those bleachers, and I mentioned that that's the kind of home I grow from, come from. And then I say, I know I'm not the only person in this room that can say that. You should see the heads that go down. not a great home to grow up in. Wrecks your self-esteem. I tell those kids, and I say, you know, I understand, you know, when you, when you're, you that when you're come from that kind of home, you're doing the same thing I did at your age. When you're leaving your house in the morning, you're grabbing a mask and you're putting it on. And you're pretending to be somebody else. Because you don't think anybody's going to want to sit next to you. You don't think anybody's going to want to be your friend because of the home you come from. I tell them that mask is a handicap also, and 
encourage them that at some point in their life they're going to have to deal with it and take it off. But I don't push them too hard. Because quite honestly, friends, that mask may be the only thing that's protecting them through these turbulent teenage years that they're facing at that point of their life. It's, it's brutal. It's brutal being a teenager. When I was a teenager, I went back to wake my father up one morning and I found his body dead of an overdose. He was 41 years old, 41. That's a young man. His life was over. I truly believe that my father was a good man. But I couldn't see it. I didn't know it because he had allowed these things, the alcohol and the drugs, to take over his life to the point where it really smothered his ability to be a good father, a good spouse, a good person. So anyway, my mom, she mom, my mom packs me and my little sister up. We were the only two left at home at that time. Packs me and my little sister up, moves us out of Ohio, moves us to the Pacific Northwest, the great state of... But not this side of Washington. The other side of Washington. So what do you think the first thing I noticed about this state was? Rains. A lot. That was not enough for my mother. She moved us to a little town called Hoquiam. And if you're from the state of Washington, you understand this. In the western part of Washington, it rains a lot. But in the town of Hoquiam, it rains a lot. Exactly. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm at, right? I'm a teenager, and I'm walking those rainy streets, searching for the same things that uh, these teens are still looking for today. Same things you looked for when you were a teenager. Walking rainy streets, searching for acceptance. Somewhere, somewhere you could, someplace you can go, take your mask off, quit pretending to be every other person on this planet, and people like you. 16 years old, walking rainy streets, searching for somebody to um, talk to. No, no, not just talk to. Somebody that would listen. Somebody that I could sit across the table from, look them in the eye, and tell them everything that is going on in my life right now. No sugarcoating. Tell them about my fears. Tell them about my frustrations. Tell them about my dreams. Tell them about my hurts. Tell them about my pains. With the confidence that that person I'm talking to will not tell another soul on this planet. They need that. We need that type of person. We need somewhere that we can really open up to. I'm walking rainy streets searching for somebody to say, I love you. Not just I love you, but I love you unconditionally. And what that means is there is not a thing you need to do to make me love you more. And there is not a thing that you will do that will make me love you less. Some of you, you have to go back like I do quite a while before you get back to those teenage memories. But that's what we were doing, the same as these kids are doing today, just walking rainy streets, searching. Searching for these things that our soul is crying out for. And if we don't find those things in healthy places, sometimes we are tempted to go other places. So... Just in case you're wondering, what decade is this guy even talking about? Okay, early 70s. This is where I'm at in this story, okay? We're in the early 70s, okay? So I'm starting to look in other places for these things that my soul is crying out for. So I start going to the parties, right? And uh, start drinking. Well, before long, I'm also drugging. And really, you know, and, and a lot of, there's, there's some of you in this room that relate exactly to what I'm going to say next, but this is what I tell teenagers. I say, when you get on that road, you know, the parties, the drinking, the drugs, that road never spirals up. That road is sort of designed to spiral down. A few years later, 
my brother and I, we left this party that we should have never gone to. We'd been drinking and drugging. And we begin to drive home from Olympia to Hoquiam, which is a 50-mile drive. About midnight, we begin this drive home, and we end up on a road we shouldn't be on. The car goes off the road, actually hits a power pole, slides down an embankment, and comes to rest at the bottom of a hill. And we got out of the car. I got out of the car. My brother got out of the car. And we looked at each other to see if we'd gotten hurt. And there were no cuts. No scratches. Nothing. Well, we started laughing and joking because, you know what, this is going to make a great story Monday morning. And we just walked away from the crashed car unharmed. Friends, do you know that sometimes the most dangerous thing we can do is walk away unharmed? You know, every time we don't get caught, every time we don't get hurt, it just makes us more confident. This is not just a teenage message right here, okay? This is also an adult message. We may change the things that we are doing, but there's still things that we get wrapped up in and involved in that we know that they're not what God intended for us to be spending our time doing it with our lives. And what happens is on some of that behavior, we, we get away with it. And then we go back and we do it again. And we get away with it. And we get away with it. And after a while, we become a little bit conditioned to it to where we think, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to get caught doing this. It's never going to get brought out into the light. Well, I just want to remind you, just because we got away with it last time absolutely has nothing to do with what might happen next time. See, that's the whole thing. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> My brother and I didn't know. We didn't know we hit a power pole. We didn't know that when we did hit the pole, the cross arm snapped off and four or five power lines come swinging down into the road. Well, I scampered up that hill in front of my brother, walked out onto that highway, and when I did, my left arm hit one of those downed power lines, and I fell on my knees. Now, you folks are very familiar with the way that electricity interacts with the human body. I know that. You see, electricity will enter your body where you make contact with it. It will then leave your body where you're making contact with something else. And for me, what that was, was, was my knees pressed against the ground. So 12 and a half thousand volts of electricity came through my arm, surged through my body, and literally exploded my knees away into the ground. And I collapsed, I fell forward, and I lay across the rest of the wires. And they just continued to burn the front of my body. I found out in a flash, sometimes you do not walk away. I woke up in a hospital in Seattle that would end up being my home for the next six months of my life. I was 21 years old. The very first morning in the, in the hospital, the doctor came in the room and he asked me to sign a release form to amputate my left arm. He had it on a clipboard and he put it in front of my face. He said, Bob, I'm sorry. You have to sign this form. We need to amputate your left arm. I looked over to see what this man was talking about. From fingertip to elbow, my arm was crisp and curled up. From elbow to shoulder, it was swollen up to three times its size. Fluids had backed up. They, they didn't have anywhere to go. Doctor made it very clear to me. If we don't take that arm off this morning, we will take more off tomorrow. Whew. Have you ever been in those situations? I mean, not that situation, that's pretty drastic. But um, have you ever been in a similar situation where 
you are put into a position where you know that you have to, if you're going to save anything, you have to give up something. I signed a release. And I know that this may not seem like much to you, but, true, but trust me, this is better than this. He came back two weeks later, put a clipboard in front of my face and said, Bob, you need to sign this release form. We need to amputate your right leg. My right leg was only held onto my body by the back flap of skin. It, it, there, was a, there was a lot of pain involved in that. And after two weeks of pain, I thought, you know, whatever is causing this amount of pain in my life, I need to get rid of. In church, I don't know, there's a ton of people in here this morning, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least one person right now listening to what I just said that is relating to it. Whatever can cause that amount of pain in my life, I need to get away from it. I need to get it out of my life. I need to get rid of it. For me, it was as simple as signing a form. And they took, took me in and amputated my right leg. Two weeks later, the doctor came back in the room and asked me to, uh, well, he didn't ask me anything. Actually, oh, here's what he asked me. He said, Bob, what do you want to do with your left leg? Now, see, I picked up on that right away because I was a young man, 21 years old, in the span of two weeks, they'd amputated two limbs. And this was the first time that anybody actually asked me what I wanted to do. He said, what do you want to do with your left leg? I said, I'd like to keep it. He hid the clipboard that was in his hand and said, we'll try. We'll try. Now, friends, I tried. Let me just tell you that right up front. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the strongest person in the world, but I'm not the weakest either. So I fought for this leg. I fought for months for this leg. But how many of you have been in situations where you're put in this situation where you realize that no matter how much you love something, no matter how much you cherish it, no matter how much you want to hang on to it, it can still be taken away from you. Does anybody connect on that? I realized I was not going to be able to save this. I said, bring the clipboard. If it's going to happen, let's get it over with. During this six-month period, they skin grafted the front of my body. And, and honestly, church, I don't know why this morning I felt compelled to give you those details that I just gave you for the last five minutes. I don't typically do that. But I truly believe that I would not sit, I believe that there's a reason I gave you those details this morning. I don't, I, I don't understand it. But even with that, I'm not telling you about skin grafting, if you don't mind. I will tell you that it's the most painful, enduring, is this thing ever going to end process that I went through during that six month period. And after six months in the hospital, they, they deemed that I was functional enough to get back out into the world, and they released me. And as soon as I got out of that hospital, I went right back out on the road that brought me in there. Back to the parties, back to the drinking, back to the drugs. And how could a person do such a thing? Well, honestly, I looked in the mirror. I told you I was 21 years old, right? I was 21 years old. I'm looking in a mirror, and I'm seeing stumps where I used to have limbs. Scars? Where I used to have skin. I thought, nobody's going to accept me. Oh, nobody's going to listen to me. And trust me, 
nobody is going to say, I love you. When I looked like this. And instead of having the courage to just sit up and say, this is me. This is me. And if you have a problem with the way I look, I totally agree with you. You have a problem. <laughs> but I don't. And if this is really, this, if this is a big issue to you, you need to understand something. In this relationship, this isn't changing. It will have to be you. Now see, instead of saying something that cool, wasn't that cool? Would that, would that have been a cool thing to say? Yeah, see, instead of saying something that cool, I just chickened out. I went out and bought a bag of dope and a 12-pack of beer. Hey, instant friends. As long as I had that garbage in my pocket, somebody sat next to me, wanted to know where I was going. Four years, I'm spiraling down that road, surrounded by the weakest friends I've ever had in my life. And when my pockets were empty, I would sit alone. I needed a good friend. I needed a strong friend. And I meet this strong friend. And this strong friend actually made me realize that I have a few, remember what we were talking about earlier? Handicaps. But not missing legs and a missing arm. Attitude, self-esteem, prejudice, the alcohol, the drugs. Friends, I admitted I had a problem. And I asked for help. And this strong friend just took me by the hand to get help. This friend takes me to a church. Church. Sunday morning church. Don't be offended by what I'm going to say next. You've got to hang with me on this one. This friend brings, brings me to a Sunday morning. In fact, I'm going to even connect a little closer to you guys. Sunday morning assemblies of God church. Brings me through the back door. I say, this is far enough. This is a joke, right? Come on, seriously. This is a joke. What kind of help could I possibly get in a place like this? I got to the back row. I said, this is far enough. Got out of my wheelchair, sat on the back row, got my young man attitude going. <laughs> my friend just sat down next to me. You see, my friend knew that God was actually powerful enough to reach the back row of a church. <laughs> In fact, you guys want good news? You want good news? God is powerful enough to reach wherever you are. I am so serious about this. God is powerful enough to reach wherever you are. I don't care how many times you've fallen. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what wrong road you've been on or are on. God is powerful enough to reach you. I don't care what's going on inside of your brain, your mind. I mean, mental illness is a really huge thing going on right now. COVID really exasperated some issues. So what happens is depression takes over. Discouragement even to the point of suicide. But let me guarantee you one thing. God is powerful enough to reach into that darkness because the light of Christ is always going to shine the brightest in the darkest places. It's a cool thing about light in general. It's even a cooler thing about the light of Jesus Christ. It will definitely shine brightest in the darkest places. So let me tell you this. Before you ever do anything that you cannot reverse, whisper his name. Just whisper it. Jesus. Oh, we've been in places so dark. If you just whisper his name, everybody hears it. Jesus. And I guarantee that there will be a beam of light come into your existence at that moment. And it will illuminate a step, one step, that will lead to life. 
not death. I'm t- hey, all I'm saying is God is powerful enough to reach wherever you are. I'm sitting on the back row of a church on a Sunday morning. I'm a young man sitting back there, got my attitude going. The guy up in front is just going on and on and on and on. And I've only got one hand. I can only cover one ear. (laughs) But this man said something. He said, God loves you and accepts you just as you are. Oh, friends, sounded like a miracle to me. Oh, not that God can love and accept all those other people in that church that that morning. Hey, do you guys know what you look like? Can I just give you a little insight of what you look like? Because here's what's going to happen. Here's what should happen. You guys got a brand new facility. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving Christ Center this space to reach the world. And if you're doing it right, there's going to be uninvited people come through those back doors. And you know what? They're not going to look church, right, church ready. They're not going to smell nice. Their hair is going to be messed up. They're still going to be shaky from something they put in their bodies in the last 24 hours. And when they come in your church, they're going to sit in the back row. Don't fill up the back rows. Leave space. Because I guarantee you, these people I'm talking about, they aren't coming down here. And if they come in here and there is no room on that back row, they're turning around and go back out the door. Keep some space open on that back row. And they're going to sit there. Do you know what you look like to them? You're beautiful. You are absolutely gorgeous. Your hair. Your hair is clean and it's combed. Your clothes are clean. You smell nice. You got these smiles on your faces. You're beautiful. When you're sitting on that back row and you're coming from out there, when somebody says God loves you and accepts you just the way you are, they're thinking, yeah, anybody on this planet can love these people. But what they're hearing is God loves and accepts me. Seriously, every scar that I have on my body, every wrong road, everything I lost. And I'm looking in a mirror. This time I'm not seeing the scars from a electrocution and skin grafting. I'm seeing the scars of a sinful, rotten life. This time I'm looking in a mirror and I'm not seeing the limbs that were lost. I'm seeing all the good people that I'd pushed out of my life. I'm looking in a mirror. I need Jesus. You know, I did the most courageous thing I ever did that morning. I didn't tell you this story, but, you know, me and my wife and my family, we have pedaled bicycles across America twice. I, I pedal a hand cycle that you crank with your arm. Called it Hope and Courage Across America. If you're really interested, there will be a book in the back, but I'm not, selling, I'm not pushing books here. Everybody said, boy, that's pretty courageous. That's pretty wild. You actually did that? Yeah, I did that. That's not the most courageous thing I've ever done with this arm, though. Do you want to know what the most courageous thing I've ever done with this arm is? I raised it in the back of a church on a Sunday morning. And I said, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Oh, that morning you should have been there. That morning I came down in the front. And I'm not going to go through the long version of that, how... I didn't want to go down there because I thought people would stare at me. And the pastor said every eye closed, every head bowed. He said it three times and people peeked anyway. (laughs) And I bowed my head and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and forgive me of all my sins and wash me and cleanse me. 
And when I got to the amen of that prayer, I became a whole man. Yes. And I know, I know, I know, I know. I only have one arm. And I have no legs. But I know something far greater than that. You know what makes me whole with never in my shoes? What makes me whole is in my heart. And now we're back to good news. There's a place in my heart like every one of yours that only Jesus Christ can fill. And the sooner we quit trying to put other things there, the sooner he can begin to fulfill the plan that he has for our lives. And that morning I thought, you know what? Yeah, here's the cool thing about God. I, do, I want you to totally, I, I want to assure you without any doubt, God loves you and accepts you just as you are. How many people do you know that will not come to church with you today because they think somewhere they got the idea that they have to stop doing something in their behavior before they're worthy to walk through those doors? And if you're the person putting that in their head, shame on you. God loves you and accepts you just as you are. But here's the cool thing. He loves you so much. He doesn't want you to stay that way. He wants to help you now to begin to be shaped and formed to who he really intended you to be from the very beginning. And that's when he'll deal with these things. Not before you come to him. After you come to him. And my life changed, and it was able to change my attitude, my self-esteem, my prejudice, the alcohol, the drugs. Six months later, I'm back at the church again. Same church, same church. Not in the back road. This time I'm down in front of everybody, down right down in the front. Brought my friend that brought me the first time. Brought her off of the back row. Brought her down to the front of the church. And I married her. I cannot talk about her without smiling. And you guys are such, you guys are fortunate today. She, she won't say you're, she is with me today. So that's what's a really cool thing. And this is my wife, Darla, sitting in the front row. Could you give her a hand for me? Now, Darla, if I spend a lot of time talking about Darla, I will hear, hear about it all the way home. But I'm only going to tell you one thing, whether I hear about it or not. Just one thing I want to tell you about my wife, Darla. Darla met me four years after I lost my limbs. I'll say it again just so you know what I'm saying. Darla met me four years after I lost my limbs. And this child of God never seems to notice but so many people will never take their eyes off of. God said, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, he says, God said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to give you uh, beauty for ashes. I'm going to make a deal. I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. What that means is you need to give me all those burned up things in your life. All those scars. All those things that have been ravished and destroyed by sin and choices and decisions. He said, then I hear the other part. I'm going to pour the oil of gladness over you for your mourning. We've all suffered losses. We all have things taken away from us. And I'm not saying that you do not deserve a period of mourning. Even the Bible distinctly speaks about seasons of mourning. But come on, you guys understand it over here and around these trees and all this stuff and this fruit better than most. Seasons are meant to change, right? If we stay in one season, Nothing moves forward. There is a time for mourning. 
And I never want to take that away from you. But remember, it's a season, and God is waiting to take that from you and pour upon the oil of gladness into your life. And here's the other one I like. And I'm going to give you a garment of praise for your despair, for your heaviness, for your depression. And what I love about the whole idea why I use the word garment, you put on a garment, right? You put on a garment. It's kind of like a coat. You don't feel the benefit of putting on a coat in, the, in January in Kashmir, you know, that warmth. You don't feel that benefit until you actually put it on. And sometimes when, with, uh, with that, what we're talking about is we have to put it on. We have to put that praise on, even though we don't feel like it, even though it's not like what we want to do, we have to put it on before we can really get the warmth and the benefit from it. This morning, God wants to change your life, but that means there might be an exchange here. You give it to him, and he'll give you something better. Would you stand to your feet, please? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You're here this morning. And the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you through this whole conversation that I've been having. And he's been telling you things in your heart that this man on the platform never came, that never came out of my mouth. He is working with you right now because you know what? He wants to see you be who he intended you to be. With your eyes closed, your heads bowed, if you're here this morning, and what you realize right now is I need Jesus. I need to invite him into my heart in a way that I've never done before so that he can begin to take that place and begin to push those other things to the side. And if those are good things in your life that have been filling up the center of your heart, don't worry, he'll see to it that you still have them. If there are things that are wrecking you and destroying you, he will give you the strength to totally remove them. If you're here this morning, you're saying, first and foremost, more than anything else I need to do this morning is surrender my life to Jesus Christ and ask him into my heart. If that's you, I want you to do something very, very courageous. I want you to raise your hand. Say, I need Jesus. Thank you. 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 I'll tell you what. Friends, I need to ask you to be bold. I need to ask you to do something even stronger. If you just raise your hand, I just want you to just come out from where you are, begin to make your way down to the front of this church. My experience has been this. Nobody wants to do that right now. But as soon as one person does it, Others will say, I can do it too. Thank you. Thank you for making that bold step. There's no shame in this. Absolutely no shame whatsoever. This is about the boldest thing you're ever going to do. Don't be shy. Come on up. You know, this is called an altar. I don't know if they put a name on it or a tag on it. This is called an altar. This is where life changed. What are you giving God? Because I tell you what, he's going to give you something far greater than what you think you're giving up. I can tell you that right now. Amen. Glory, glory to God. Glory to God. You're here this morning. And you've got Jesus Christ in your heart, but you know what? You've been beaten up. You've been scarred. You feel that what's going on in your life now makes you the ugliest person on this planet. I'm telling you right now. When he says, I'll give you beauty for ashes, he's serious. If that's you this morning and you want to make that exchange, be just begin to come away from where you are right now and start making your way up to the front of this, up to this altar. You're here this morning in your suffering loss. Something has been taken away from you and it's creating a deep, empty pain in your life. He says, you know what? If I'm ready. 
He says, I'm ready. If you give it to me, I'm going to give you gladness. If that's you, just begin to make your way up. Just begin to make your way up. You're here this morning and you feel in despair. You feel depressed. You feel like there's just nothing. The color has been sucked out of your world and all you see is gray. God says, if you're ready, I'm ready. If you're ready to put on that garment of praise, I am ready. I am ready to fill your life with gladness. I don't want to rush this moment, so here's the way this works. I mean, if you have to leave, it's, it's 1107, if you haven't looked at your phone lately. If you have to leave, uh, I'm not stopping you. God's not stopping you. But if you don't have to leave and you want to do some business with God this morning, we're ready to work with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the commitments that are being made right now in this room the courageous acts of faith to actually move forward. Heavenly Father, I want, to tell you, I want to linger here today and I want to take the opportunity to pray with each and one of these individually if that is what they desire. But I need to close this in a prayer. So right now, Heavenly Father, those that are standing here, for those of those that are standing here and they are asking you into their heart for the first time. The prayer that they would pray is simply this. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I know you sent your son Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for my sin. But I am sorry that I made you do that. I ask now in the name of Jesus if you, if you would please forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me whole in Jesus' name. And if you're here right now and, 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 and really what you need to do is you need to make some exchanges in your life. You need to make some exchanges. You need to give up those ashes. You need to, to, to give up. It's time for you to move on from the morning. You need to put on that garment of praise. I want to just give you that opportunity right now, Heavenly Father. <laughs> I am tired and weary and worn out. And the burdens I've been carrying are too great. You're offering me a, an exchange and I'm ready to take it. I am so ready. Take my ashes, my sin, my scars. Give me that beauty. Take, take my mourning, Lord. I'm ready. Give me, give me gladness. And Lord, you need to pull me through the depression, the despair, the discouragement. I want to put on that garment of praise. And even when I don't feel it, praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand right now. For those of you standing here right now, I don't want you to just turn around and walk out of here because I don't believe that God has finished with what you, with what he wants to do this morning. Take some time. I'm going to figure out how to work that little lifty elevator thing over there. And I'm going to come down around and I will, and I will take an opportunity and I will, I will linger and pray with you as long as you would wish. Up a hand this morning. Thanks. Buddy. How many of you... How many of you, this is the first time you've accepted Christ? Raise your hand. Be bold. This is your first time. Raise your hand. Right on. Anyone else, this is your first time. We are so thankful. 
And uh, my wife Stephanie's right over here. We'd love for you to just connect with her. And uh, we're going to worship now. And if you need to step out, totally understand. But we're going to just spend some time praying and asking God to cement some things in our heart. One of our values here is to lead people to Jesus and to teach them how to follow him. And to that end, we're going to give all of our energy, all of our strength, all of our effort by the power of his Holy Spirit. You agree with me? Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship the King of Kings.